Hello. I'm John Patrick Higgins. And these are my strange stories. Why not relax, kick off your shoes, and enjoy the peculiar worlds inside my head. Inside John Patrick Higgins. The Rum Barbers Brian Spindo, the owner of Herodrome, West Norwood's premier hairstyling boutique, was an unhappy man. He had left hairdressing school with sharp scissors and a carefully sculpted head full of ideas. He had opened up his own shop in an up-and-coming area of South London, but the upping never came and daily Brian found himself staring past the pyramids of dax wax in his window to a sign reading backwards in the fierce sunlight, OAP cuts seven pound. Brian had balked at the word OAP and had originally advertised senior haircuts, but the locals had never encountered that particular Americanism and stayed away in droves fearful of modish Spanish hairstyles. It was Saturday morning. It should have been Brian's busiest time, but he sat and drank milky coffee as he stared out of the shop window. There had been a Saturday girl once, to make the coffee and wash and sweep up hair, but now there was just Brian and Steve. When Brian had let the rest of the staff go, he had kept Steve on, almost as a pet, Steve lived off scraps, he never argued, he didn't muck about with Brian's playlists, and he would do the old men, which made Brian's skin crawl. Steve lived with his parents, read library books, and thought Brian was a genius. Brian stared balefully out of the window. His coffee was no longer hot, and he held the mug in both hands. Steve leafed through another one of his dust-jacketed hardbacks in his corner. Magic FM played buoyantly in the background, while nobody came in. Boring, in it, said Steve. Brian shot him a contemptuous look. If you're hard up for something to do, why not try sweeping the floor, Stephen? Done it. Rinse the combs, then. We've done it. All of them, the steel ones. Yep. Brian thought for a moment. Go and get me an egg and sausage panini. Steve didn't even look up. He pointed over Brian's shoulder to a small wax paper package by the sink behind him. He sighed. There was absolutely nothing to do. It was boring. What are you reading? said Brian eventually. Library book, said Steve. I can bloody well see that. What's it about? This was the first time that Brian had ever shown any interest in anything Steve had been reading. The question disturbed him. Things must be bad if Brian was showing an interest in his library books. He must have exhausted every other avenue of conversation. It's about true mysteries, said Steve. Restless bones, winged serpents in the Arizona desert, Canadian werewolves, that sort of thing. New bloke in the library suggested it. Bit of a weirdo, but it's a very interesting story. Why do I continue to employ you? said Brian sourly. Steve's head fell forward. He continued to read, mouthing the words as he went, his finger tracing across the page. Brian snatched the book from his lap. What a load of rubbish! He flicked the book open and began to read in a stilted, mocking voice. Rheumatism can be cured with a mixture of seven beetles and six laurel berries crushed together. Toothache is cured by wearing a tooth of a mouse around the neck. Brilliant. To get rid of warts, you need the juices of a skull, human or animal, boiled in water and taken in a glass of beer. Well, that's quite a chaser. What do they mean, the juices of a skull? Are they making stock? What a load of rubbish. It's not rubbish, shouted Steve. 
There was a moment of electric silence. Steve's eyes widened. Brian snaked forward and braced his assistant's face with his hand, fingers over his ears, thumb digging deep into Steve's cheek. Buttery puppy fat oozed through Brian's fingers. Rubbish, he hissed. It's not rubbish, said Steve. It's true. At least two of it's true. Brian snatched up the book again and read out, Witches were able, by means of a poppet, to wound, sicken, and otherwise affect victims from a distance. The poppet, more usually a waxen image of a man dressed in either hair or nail clippings of the intended victim, would then be stuck with pins. Correspondent infirmities would often ensue. It's true, said Steve. I've read about it. It's even in the Bible. Right, said Brian, releasing his assistant's cheek. Get to Costcutters and buy me a gingerbread man. You haven't finished your panini, said Steve. I'm not going to eat it, you clown. I'm going to wrap it in hair and stick pins in it. Steve attended to the old man's haircut while Brian turned his attention to the gingerbread man. As Steve was finishing up with the straight razor, which dipped into the deep wrinkles on the man's neck like a stylus hitting its groove, Brian shimmered in with a dustpan and brush. There was his treasure, the buried silver. He wound the hairs around the gingerbread man's neck and looked out into the main shop. The old man was paying. Seven pounds exactly, no tip. Tight bastard, thought Brian. I almost wish this would work. He waited for the clang of the shop's bell and moved out into the shop front, pressing his nose against the glass. There was the old bastard, newly shorn, shuffling down the street. Right, Stephen, said Brian, watch and learn. Brian pulled his scissors from his pocket and plunged them into the heart of the gingerbread mannequin. At once the old man stopped and fell to his knees. He slumped forward on the wet pavement, curled and fetal, his fingers clutching at the air about him, his eyes fixed and glassy. A small gang of women gathered, clucking uselessly around him and obscuring the stricken man from Brian and Steve's view, but they were no longer looking out of the window. They were looking alternately at each other and at the crumpled gingerbread figure in Brian's hands. Oh my God, said Steve. I told you it's real. Don't be stupid, said Brian, eyes darting. It's just a coincidence. But he was visibly shaking and licking his dry lips. A customer came in the shop and sat in the chair without acknowledging either man. They remained rooted to the floor. I haven't got all day, said the customer. It was another old bloke with unwashed hair and great furry ears like mouldy peppers. Brian doubted his claim to not have all day. Another seven pounds in the bank, he thought. I'll do you, sir, he said. Sorry for the delay. Oh, Stephen, could you pop along to Coscott and get me another gingerbread man? This one has hair on it. This isn't working, said Brian. I'm so glad you said that, Brian, said Steve. It's not right killing off all those people. Brian shot his assistant a look of contempt. I don't give a flying fuck about those miserable old shits. Who'd miss them? The problem is they're pretty much our only customers and killing them off is hurting business. Brian had taken to robbing his customers before they left the shop, confident they would be dead before they found out. But they were pensioners and the pickings were slim. Man cannot live by travel suites alone. If only there were a way to turn a profit on this. What's the point of having the power of life and death if you can't earn money from it? Steve said nothing. 
His relationship with Brian had changed considerably since his boss had discovered a talent for magical murder. Five people had died as a result of Brian's malign influence, and those were the ones that Steve knew about. There was no reason to suspect there weren't more, and in any case it seemed obvious that he wasn't going to stop. Brian was enjoying himself. He had to be stopped, but what could Steve do? I have it, said Brian, derailing Steve's train of thought. I know how I can earn more money. Who gets all the trade round here? Head chefs, said Steve. Head chefs, exactly. Inexplicable, but exactly. Nicky Good had opened head chefs, making a meal of your main, at the same time as Brian had opened Herodrome. But while he had languished in obscurity, the hairdresser of choice for gentlemen of a certain age, a clientele who thought that a free eyebrow trim was a right and not a privilege, head chefs had a young and cool patronage that required cutting-edge cutting and were happy to pay for it. Brian could only look on enviously as he swept the dandruff shoulders of D-mob suits. Brian took to making regular trips to head chefs. At first, Nicola was wary. Brian had shown her nothing but enmity since she had opened the salon, especially as she was doing so much better than he was. Why, she'd even opened a nail bar on the premises, and that too was booming. And there he was, in his squalid little shop, hacking back nostril hair at seven quid a pop. Well, she couldn't blame him for holding it against her, and yet here he was, dropping by, all smiles and pastries. "'Better latte than never!' he exclaimed one Tuesday afternoon, hovering with the aforementioned beverages. "'We're both professionals in a tough business. I don't see why we can't get along.' And so it began. Brian would drop by once or twice a week, with cake or ice cream, and the pair of them would gossip and leaf through celebrity magazines, mocking the cellulite of the rich and famous. And then the death started. Two or three times a week, young men died of heart attacks in her salon. Young, healthy men with no previous heart problems expired under Nicky's scissors. The first time that it happened, it was shocking. The police had to be called in. Health and safety officers had ransacked the place, closing her down for a week. Then they closed her down for another week. They found nothing. Nowadays she had the emergency services on speed dial and her chairs on casters wheeling the offending corpses into the nail bar when it happened. The ambulance men let themselves in round the back. The police had been sniffing round again, which was unpleasant. But no charges were ever brought against her. It didn't matter. Word got out. Graffiti had changed the name of the shop to Dead Chefs and customers began to stay away in droves. Brian was experiencing an abrupt reversal of fortune. A new and ferociously fashionable clientele was filing through the doors of the Herodrome, holding out pictures from magazines and demanding coffee. Brian took the OAP signs out of the window and replaced the Dax Wax and Brill Cream with displays of granite and tangerine styling putties. Steve started cutting hair with scissors rather than clippers. He proved to have little talent for it and was soon relegated to coffee maker and floor sweeper. A couple of bright-eyed young women started as stylists and Brian started offering head massage as an extra. But he still couldn't stop killing. He had greatly reduced his visits to head chefs. Pressure of business, Nicky darling, you understand. But he'd pop by there once a week touching base for the competition, as he put it. In truth, there was no longer much competition between the two, but still it continued. Once a month, somebody died in Nicky's chair. She was inured to it by now. A few white wine fueled evenings with Brian, who was a hoot, convinced her to stay open. But really, what was the point? The shop was cursed. Steve turned up at Costcutters for his usual gingerbread man. 
There was Saeed, who usually served him, leafing through a copy of Top Gear magazine. "'Where's the gingerbread men, Saeed?' he said. "'Sorry, boss. Sold out. Job lot of them. Sold to somebody else this morning.' Steve filed back to Brian, who was doing something wildly daring with a pair of heated tongs. "'Never mind, Steve. There's always tomorrow. I cannot believe how many I get through.' And he returned to conversation with his customer about whether Jaffa cakes were indeed true cakes. "'Oh, you don't have to do that, babes,' said Brian." Though I am well stressed out, work is a bloody nightmare. Brian sat back in Nicky's chair as she gave him a head massage. I want to, said Nicky. You've been such a good mate to me since the business went to shit. I know, it's been a nightmare for you. Do you know what I mean? If there's anything I can do, don't hesitate. I feel like a profiteer. He barked with laughter as she massaged his temples. You sure you don't need a trim, she said. I want to give something back to my best friend. If only you were straight. Uh, thank you, lady, he said, his eyes closed. Her hands moved down to his shoulders. He was really relaxed. You don't fancy a trim, then, she said. I don't get many young men through the door these days. Make a change from clouds of dandruff. I remember, said Brian. No, thanks. I'm looking good at the moment. I've got a date on Tuesday. Swiss? Nicky started working down Brian's arm, massaging his biceps, the cool palms of her hands running down his forearms. Shame. Ooh, how about a manicure? I think Bella's still here. Bella! She bellowed. Hello, Miss Good. Bella emerged from the nail bar. She was older than Brian expected and wearing a headscarf. Bella, could you give Mr. Spindo here the full works? He's a personal friend of mine. Of course, Miss Good. I'll take care of him. Well, there's no need, said Brian. Oh, let me, said Nicky. You've been so kind to me. Let me. And with a sigh, Brian sat back in the chair and extended a regal hand. Bella set to work. It was a good hour before the lacquer dried, but Brian looked down at his nails. They were perfect. Pink and white like top side of beef, his fingers white-tipped like magic wands. He waved them about, admiring them. He handed Bella a ten-pound note. Above and beyond, darling, they look amazing. She smiled and backed out of the room. She was carrying a small dish that Brian hadn't previously noticed. Brian got up. Nicky was nowhere to be seen. "'Where's the boss?' he said. But there was no response. He started poking about, wandering in the nail bar. There was nobody there. There was nobody in the shop at all apart from himself. He shouted out, but nobody answered. "'Such you then?' he said and turned out the lights and made his way to the front door. He couldn't lock up because he didn't have the keys, but that was hardly his problem. If Nicky was going to sod off and leave him with that weirdo manicurist, so be it. He was going home. He'd gone twenty feet down the street when the lights flashed on behind him. He turned to see the shadowy faces of Nicky and Bella, strangely underlit. Brian gave a thank-goodness shrug and did a bit of pantomime, waving his glossy fingernails in the night air. As if from a prearranged signal, Bella upturned the small dish. The contents looked like parmesan shavings. She poured them onto something that Nicky had in her hand. Brian grinned, shrugging again. He started to make his way back to head chefs when he saw for the first time what it was that Nicky held in her hand. It was a gingerbread man. A gingerbread man dusted in nail filings. His hand was already on the doorknob by the time Nicky plunged her nail file through the biscuit, cracking it straight down the middle. He was discovered in the shop doorway by a dog walker early the next morning. Both bits of him.
Inside John Patrick Higgins was brought to you by the color blue and the letter G. Written and performed by John Patrick Higgins, it was produced and edited by Graham Watson. Thank you.